I guess start out with a quick introduction. My name is Travis Shu. I'm a mentor on Team 971. Um, was a student on the team back when I was in high school, went to college, graduated, and I've been a mentor since. So i um, been with the team for a few years. Uh, presentation I'm going to go over today is kind of covering some of the, I guess, best practices within CAD that sort of we've learned over the years and that at least that myself recommends. So I'm going to go through. I have a lot of stuff in here. If you have questions about what's there, please um, feel free to ask them during the middle, but um, we'll, and we'll or collect them up at the end. So just to start out from a quick diff quick at the start. Um, what, what's the difference? Can anyone tell me what the difference between these two parts are? So these are CAD model. We have two different axles. Anyone? Yeah? Material? Material? No? Yeah? It's one in uh, shaded with Yeah, that, that's probably about the only. Yeah, I think that's about the only difference here. One's uh, got some different lighting on it. So it's actually physically, you know, these are the same, dimensionally the same part here. Um, but if we actually look inside of them and look at how the part was made, they're made with two very different ways. Um, so you look at the one on the left and you see that it's got, you know, it's got some broken features in there, some stuff that, you know, at one point was working but now isn't. Um, it's got a lot more items in the feature tree um, than the one on the right. And how does this impact us? Well, it means that the one on the right was probably easier to both easier to create and will be easier to maintain as we go forward and we build the, as we change the design the robot and need to come back and change things. So we're going to kind of at a high level we'll go through and talk about so what are the things on the right that make that part better than the part on the left. Um, and I guess I should start out with a disclosure. disclosure. Um, I'm assuming that people have some familiarity with CAD here and that they have some familiarity with the SolidWorks platform. Uh, if not, I guess you can pick some of this. You'll probably not all of it might make sense, but we'll figure it out as you go. Um, so just digging a little bit deeper into so what it means to make it maintainable. Um, so let's say that we designed this shaft for a gearbox. Our gearbox is now needs an extra gear in it or something where you know, we need to change the width of the gearbox. We want to go in and want to adjust the shaft geometry. Well, to do that in the different, two different parts, you know, the top part um, is on the, the simpler part. It's got one sketch that has all the features in it. You can go in and you can edit the dimension for the length. The other guy, it's like stacked up from a bunch of boss extrudes, so it's kind of harder to go in and figure out where the length is and update it. So it's going to be a lot easier to update and maintain the top one than it is the bottom one. And we'll go through that in more detail later. So that's kind of the high level of why it's, you know, it's important, not just what the part looks like at the end. It also is important about how you get to that part. So I'm going to go through and sort of talk through the first part, talk through how we can go about capturing the design intent and how we model our parts. Then we'll go through a little bit about some of the the tools that we found for making models easy to update. Then we'll go through how can you can kind of create robust references through parts and then end up with some tips and tricks for working quickly in CAD. Um, so first of all, I'll start off with capturing design intent. So what does this mean? Um, when you're designing the part, it's designed to serve a certain function. And that function should be represented in how you go about building out the part. So here's an example here. We've got this part here. Um, Got this black piece right here. It's, it's a 3D printed part that we are using to, we used in, I guess this is our 2018 arm gear box. It's basically holding a potentiometer here. Um, it's got, um, it's got a, the potentiometer has, um, has a, a pulley on it, and that pulley is connected to the axle that it's measuring the position of. Um, so this is kind of the design. Um, we can think, so I think you know, the first question, um, or, you know, so, so this is the part, the kind of the output of it, so we'll kind of work backwards. But presumably, you know, we're starting out the design, have some idea of what we want to do. We need a piece that basically takes this encoder and mounts it to this gearbox. And so if you think about this piece, we really have two different ways that we could model this piece, or two different, like from a SOLIDWORKS perspective. You could kind of you could think about, well, I could, you could start from this view um, where you look head on, or you could start from this side view. And you basically, you know, you have one feature that has that base view, and then you come in with the other features to to put in the, the, extra, the, the rest of it. Um, so we think about this, um, you know, we can think about this in terms of like what are the sort of the core things that we're trying to accomplish with this part? And what are their relative priorities? So kind of two main things that, you know, I, I put together that we're trying to do here. Um, one, we're trying to hold the potentiometer at the right belt spacing. So, you know, it's got these features with this slot and it's going to be able to mount here and then we'll be able to tension it and then tighten it down to hold the potentiometer. Um, hold the belt spacing at the right distance. Um, and then the other sort of secondary feature is, well, once the potentiometer is mounted, you know, the belt here needs to line up with the, you know, the pulley here needs to line up with the pulley there for the belt to work. So those are kind of the two main sort of features or functions of this part. 
um, that I kind of came up with. Um, and so, like, and then I, you know, we can th think about, well, what's the most important feature of this part? Which ones, if we think about what's the relative importance of them, which one do we want to prioritize? Um, and so, kind of, my, my thought was, well, probably most important is how we're holding the, and spacing the potentiometer. Because that's like, you know, it's got to, it's got to be at the right size to hold to, and to locate it all. So when thinking about designing the parts, like, well, if that's our most important thing, then we want to structure the part to reflect that. Um, so if you look at, dig into the part and actually look how we modeled it. Um, we start out with this boss extrude. And the boss extrude is the shape of that, that side view. And you can see a lot of the design features in here are captured in, in one location. So we've got these slots, we've defined the length of travel on the slots to kind of to give you how much, how much room do you want to, uh, for misalignment do you want to account for. We've got this distance here, which, which set, you know, is, is coupled in from the belt spacing. And then you've got the mounting location for the potentiometer and sort of the overall size that matches the, the shape of the potentiometer. So kind of this here, this picture, this picture describes most of what the part is. Um, and then if you look as we go through, so the secondary thing of how do we then make it so it's spaced right? Well, the spacing at the right distance, that's based on sort of we had to put this cutout in to be able to shift the potentiometer over so the belt lined up. Well, that feature came in as a cut extrude later on. So if you look, go back to, to this view, we could have started with this, the view on the side, and then come in and you know, cut out the, the slots in the potentiometer axis. But that doesn't make as much sense. Um, and so sort of. If you think about sort of how the parts lined up, you can make it so that it's both clearer to understand what's happening um, and it's easier to update. So here's another example here. Um, so we have this part here. This is from our 2019 um, climber. We've got this tube that we wanted a rod end in. This is, this is it in the final assembly. So we've got this, this piece here. Um, so we got three different views, kind of logical views that you could start out with on this. You could start out from the side. You could start out from the end. You could start out from the top. Um, so, looking at sort of the picture we have here, what are the sort of the main design functions of this piece here? Anyone? Yes, Andrew? Uh, I think it needs to have a pretty precise distance of the gutter to go at the end, the center distance. Yep. The yep, that's one thing. We need to be able to keep the hole located from the end of the tube the right distance. That's a critical design feature here. Anything else? Yep, we have, to have a, um, we have to have a mounting spot for us to be able to attach this you know, rod end to the end of the, the tube and that's, you know, let this bolt clear here. Anything else? No. You have to have something to hold that piece steady into that tube. Yep, so yeah, and then the third thing, we need to locate the tube end within the rod. So those are the, actually the exact same three things that I came up with um, in preparing for this. So what's... Uh, how about from a student now? Um, what's the rel which one do we think is the most important? If we were to pick one of those, it's the key function of this part. Which one would it, that be? Any students? We got a lot of you. Ben, how about you? Um, holding the shaft in place. Um, like locating it to the tube here. Okay, why do you say that? Okay. So I think that that's certainly an important functionality, um, but I guess I would argue that that's probably not the first thing we're thinking about in terms of like, like the parts, you know, all of those three features, the part won't work without them. It's just a question of what's the most defining aspect of the piece. You have a, where the hole is located? Where the hole is located. Which hole? The, this hole or that? Yeah. Okay. Why do you say that? Because that's your critical dimension essentially from where you want the tube to be to where you're ever yeah. you're mounting it. That, that, was the, that was the tact I took on this because so this is like basically defining kind of how much clearance you have and how long, you know, how long the, you know, how it's going to stack up in the assembly. Um, I think you could definitely build a part from either way. It's just a question. In some places, it's like the, 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 the line between what's most and more important is, is harder to determine. But we can, you know, I guess for this sake, as kind of prioritize them. Well, let's form the pivot point. Let's provide the clearance for the mounting bolt. And then let's locate it to the tube. So we can go through and look at you know, what does that look like when you build the part out. Um, 
So this is that first sketch in this assembly. Um, you can see that it's captured, you know, we've got the location and the size of that hole that forms the pivot. We've got the distance of that pivot from the end. And this end is actually, we'll see later, is actually the end of where the tube is. So it's very clear, you know, when we, we want to basically control the total length of the rod assembly. So it's going to stack, be a stack up of the tube and then the two end rods. So it's clear here what that dimension is. And then we've got this dimension here that's the, the extra clearance. So that, that kind of defines the core, the core foundation of the part. One thing you'll notice, the part here has fillets in there, you know, edges there. That's not actually core to what's going on here. So we didn't put it in this, this sketch here. Um, we go to the next one, then we put the fillets in, and then we put a hole in for clearance, and then now we're starting cutting the, the, the room for the bolt. So it's, it's got basically just one key feature dimension here. That's how wide a slot do we need to put in for the bolt head to fit in. And then the last, we now have to add some locating boss. So we have, on the end of this face, we can now extrude out um, the piece. And so that was the kind of, that's how we can sort of break out those three functionalities and sort of step through them in the, their order of importance. Um, so that, this, this showed two simple sort of simple examples of that. Um, that every part that you approach, um, we should think about in terms of what is the function of this and how do we sort of capture the essence of that with the, the starting sketch. Um, sometimes that's pretty obvious. Um, here are two pieces. This one's um, a flat piece, so it's designed to be cut on a, like a CNC router. Um, over here, we have a radially symmetric piece that's designed to be um, turned on a lathe. Um, and it's kind of, it's, it's clear, on this guy, it's clear that the, the flat pattern is the most, you know, the, the flat view, that's going to be the most important sort of functional view of the piece here. What? Um, yeah, so you're asking about, is there a reason we chose to have the, chose to have the origin up there? This one. Yes, here. Um, yeah, I think that, it, you know, you want to, we'll get to this later, but you want to choose a location for the origin that's logical for other things that are happening. I mean, in here, the, probably the two logical choices would be the middle of the, the bolt here or the top there. I don't know if it particularly makes a difference there. I think it was more of like, the, this, the, this is the, the datum of where the assembly is really, is, you know, one thought is the datum for the assembly is where that tube intersects with the, the part here. So it kind of ties it to that. Um, either one would work. It's a good question. Um, so, so here, the, you know, if, it's, if it's done on a router, you're probably starting with a boss extrude that captures most of the profile. If it's going to be made on a lathe, you're probably starting with a revolve that's going to capture most of the, the circular profile. Um, so next sort of principle we kind of or thing we shy for is that you know, we talk about starting with the design intent. Well, the second thing is that once you're starting with that, that first sketch or feature, you want to basically, you want to capture, you know, what are all the, you want to capture the key functionality of that part in one sketch. So the idea is that um, there's a lot of things in, you know, in the robot designs, there's often a lot of things that are trying to, you know, work together and fit together in a given space. So if you look at, this is our intake assembly from our 2019 robot. Um, we've got this motor here. We've got a gear train that's connecting that motor and through a reduction to the intake wheels. And we've got this tube here um, that we're, that the, that's our structural member. So we have a couple of things that are sort of going on in a compact space. We want to basically be able to figure out how they all fit together. So one of the ways we do that is when we're laying out the part. For, so this is the part for the, um, for the transmission plates. Um, we want to basically lay out the, the piece so that we can have all of those key functions in one sketch. Um, so what we've done here, this is the first sketch in the assembly. This is actually a sketch before an extrude. Um, sometimes we do this, sometimes we don't. Um, so it really depends on what, what's going to be less complicated. Um, but here you can see that we sort of laid out those key functions that we talked about. We've got the motor sketched in here as a circle. We've got that front tube sketched in here as a circle, and we've got those wheels drawn in. And then you have the gears connecting them. So by putting those pieces out in one sketch, we can then relate them together and help have SolidWorks help us like, lay out the, you know, have SolidWorks manage the constraints between them and help us optimize the placement of them. So if you look through here, there's a couple of things here. Well, so the gears are defined so that they're going to be you know, spaced out from each other at the right spacing, because um, you know, the gears need to mesh from each other. That's a constraint in here. Um, then we have, you know, there's a certain level of clearance left, so we left a, there's a set of clearance between the wheels and the tube, left a reasonably large set of clearance, a, you know, reasonably large gap here because, you know, as we hit things and if the axle bends, we don't want the wheels to start rubbing on the tube. Um, 
have clearance between the motor and the front tube because they need to be able to assemble and we don't want to have any, any challenges from that. And then we also sort of recess the, the wheels in from the front of the robot. So kind of by putting all of the, the pieces into one sketch, we're able to sort of balance them out and then sort of put in the constraints that sort of drive, that are you know, the core design ideas and then let SOLIDWORKS sort of optimize where exactly all of those places go. So we, we're not constraining exactly you know, where that gear spacing is. Um, and then that was the first feature in this part. Um, we go on to the next feature. The next feature is where we start building out the gearbox plate that goes on it. So you can see here, it's actually referencing back to that first sketch. And so now we're adding on the bearing bores. We're adding on the outside profile of the gearbox so that it covers all of those key components that we have. Um, and then we're adding in the spacer that, that ties that gearbox together. Um, so by, and I guess we'll cover, talk about this a little more later, but sort of the core idea here is, well, let's lay out where everything is. Let's get all the things that like matter together at the highest level in one place so we can kind of optimize the, the design. And then we start building on top of that and put the feet, add the features in um, to build, build up the part. And then as we keep going down, we start adding in bolt holes and then other you know, other features for like lightning or things like that. So that's an example of a simple part. This is a more complicated, oh, yes? I have a question about the design. Yeah. Um, gears uh, right here? Yeah. Um, so that was based on, well, you can kind of see it in this place. Um, we're, we're trying to get the, the motor and the tube and the wheel all tightly together so we can have, you know, as much clearance for the ball to go through. Um, and so it was really about kind of, there was some iteration in what gear ratios we chose to be able to get this wheel to be as close as possible to that motor. And belts take up more space for a given reduction than a gear. Um, we like them elsewhere because they're quieter, but they, they do take more space. So it's really, you know, it kind of fits what's the design is. Um, so this here, um, this here is a picture from our 2018 arm gearbox. This is actually, I think this is the first sketch in the gearbox. You see there's a lot of stuff going on in here. That's because in the gearbox there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so here we're using SolidWorks um, sort of capture the location of all of the sort of key interface points. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, what length chain were we going to use? What size gears were we going to use? Where could we fit the motors to keep them from intersecting with other things like the drivetrain or the, so the drivetrain motors or the drivetrain itself? Um, you know, we're trying to spend a lot of time sort of playing with where all the pieces went um, to get it to all fit together. So not, there's not everything that's in the assembly is in this sketch. There's a lot of it in here. Um, and we're able to use SOLIDWORKS to kind of like lay out all the constraints and help us optimize um, around what we're doing. And sort of played around with a couple constraints. Um, so changed around sort of the, the, the constraints in here. To, you know, we could get it to the point where everything really fit in here. Yes? How many hours were put into making that plate? We, that out? we probably spent, uh, you asked how many hours we put into the, the plate. I would say maybe 30% of the time spent on this gearbox um, was spent at, at this sketch or the sketch, there's a sketch, you know, right after it for the other other axis. So a lot of time was spent, a lot of time was spent figuring out where everything went here um, before we actually got to actually putting in all of the features that you see here that made the gearbox work. Hours? Yeah, oh, I don't. Um, hours? We did this five hours or something or six hours, somewhere in there. I don't know. It's over a couple of days. Time. Yeah, it's a lot of time. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great point. The, um, gears, gears you are defined by both their, their pitch diameter, which is kind of defines how they mesh, and then there's the outer major diameter for defining how they clear. If we go back to these guys, these here, um, not, these are all drawn with the, the pitch diameters, but sometimes in like sketches where we really care what's going on, um, this guy here, we actually went in and drew the outer diameter of the gear on top of the pitch diameter because we wanted to make sure that there was enough clearance to cover the teeth when it ran into things. So we'll draw both. It really depends on what, what constraint we're trying to capture. Um, so and then this is just another quick example here. Um, here's a, the, that linkage for our 2019 climber. Um, and we're using this sketch. This is a, you know, actually you know, two sketches in. And the first two sketches, we're sort of laying out how the linkage um, all the, where all the pivot points for the linkage are and how the linkage operates to be able to collapse the foot, you know, have a foot for climbing and then collapse that. 
so sort of the, the next thing that sort of helps capture design time, once you kind of have an idea of where you're approaching it from, as you're putting dimensions in, you really want to put the dimensions in based on what's the, what do you care about, not like what is convenient to dimension. So these two here, um, I guess this is, a, this is one of the, the, the cable pulleys for our 2018 um, arm. And you know, right here we have two sketches. This is the same, functionally it's the same sketch. Um, but, and it's fully constrained, so that's good. Um, but you'll notice that there's an entirely different set of dimensions on both of these. Um, and there's, it makes a big difference in sort of how the parts, um, you know, capturing the design intent of the part. So the one on the left is actually what was in the model. This is just a, something I made up. Um, but here we have a couple, you can kind of, the dimensions here are all capturing very key parts of the design, key design decisions. So right here we have the outside diameter, so that's going to determine what ratio we get out of this. Um, in the, this piece basically was designed to have some cables come around and then they, they looped around into the middle and were terminated on a separate piece in the middle. Um, so the cables come and they loop around something. So we defined what that, what that bend diameter was because we, we had a minimum bend diameter for the cable that we, that we needed to respect. Um, and then we wanted to fit the cables through a gap. And the cables had a certain amount of, you know, there's a the minimum, that, minimum gap size we needed to basically fit the, to fit the cables through. So we define what that minimum gap was here. And then the last one is, you know, we wanted to balance the, the structural stiffness of the piece. So, you know, basically how thick, we wanted to balance the, the thickness of the web for how thick it was to be for the strength that we needed, but also how thin could we make it to keep the weight down. So those are this key kind of, a lot of the, you know, basically the key design decisions that went into this piece here. Um, you can see that here, they're all captured explicitly with dimensions. If you're like, well, what if I want to make it a little lighter? You go to this guy and you change it there and it would be, Clear, you know what your what your impact. And you're like, oh, I want to make it a little bigger diameter on the OD. You go right here. That's not necessarily the same as here. These guys, you know, it's functionally it, it, the part works. It's just not going to be as easy to go in and, and maintain it later. Um, another sort of way we talk about design capturing design intent. So we we over here we are using basically dimensions to be able to to um, position and you know control what the the size and shape of the part was. Um, in SolidWorks, you can also use sketch relationships to constrain and control, control where the part is. So this is some, another exercise. So over here we have, we have three, three dimensions over here and nine sketch relations. And over here we have 12 dimensions. So same amount, basically the same amount of information, um, getting to the same end result. It's really about what is, which one is better at capturing what we're trying to do with the piece. So, over here, let's, well, I guess first back up to the piece. So this is a, I guess this was a, an anchor, a, like a tie-down hoop um, for the 2018 arm. Um, it's got, and it had some bolts to mount it together. So we needed to basically locate the bolts so that they didn't, you know, interfere, so that they fit around the part and that we could line up the bolt holes on the other piece. And then also we needed to, um, we wanted to have it, you know, the part's symmetric, so we want to have the bolts, the, the, the holes on the, the right side the same as the holes on the left side. So. Well, you know, over here, everything is explicitly dimensioned out where it is. We even have a different dimension on each of the holes. Um, you go over here and you say, well, we know that we want all of these little nubs that we're adding on for, for hole locations. We all want them to be the same size. We're doing the same thing, so let's make them the same diameter. Um, so that's captured by one dimension here, and then there's these equal relationships from, between the different diameters. Um, the other thing I already mentioned, well, we want them left and right the same. So we've got a midpoint relationship here and a midpoint relationship here off the center lines to or the sketch line to basically constrain it left right. And then we want them to, oh, that's not, we want them to be at the same height. So we have um, these lines here, these sketch lines that are tying the two together. They're both horizontal to basically make sure that they're the same level there. Um, and then we have, you know, we have, then we start getting to defining the location. And so here we wanted to have it on the outside diameter of the, the radius. Oh, sorry. Um, and down at the bottom, we just set them at a certain width. So this is a lot, you know, capturing the information in a way that, like, is core to sort of what the piece was, you know, the function of the part. Um, and the advantage of this is that, you know, if we start wanting to change the part, we'll say, well, actually, you know, let's say this diameter changes. We want to basically make it, you know, we need to update that. Well, the location of the hole will actually, you know, the intent is to have it on the edge. So it's going to keep staying on the edge as you make the inside bigger. So you won't really have to do anything on that. Or let's say you come in here and you're like, you know what? Looks like that's not much enough material for putting the bolt on. Um, but I want to make that bigger. Or I want to make it smaller because it's intersecting something. Well, you just go in and there's one dimension you change it. So using, you know, generally my preference is to try to figure out how to constrain it with 
relationships before constraining it with dimensions because often relationships are you know better at capturing the core intent of what you're trying to do because um, there's kind of, usually there's sort of geometric relationships that tie the piece together so this is the same part but delved in a little deeper and showing all the showing all the relationships that are captured at you know an earlier stage there's a lot of things in here um, that you really couldn't do with dimensions uh, mostly I guess around how things are tangent to each other um, and there's also also using sort of sketch lines and relations to basically make it so that you know this side is even to that side. Um, cool. Another sort of thing, you, you kind of saw it in those other two parts, but we're using construction geometry. So construction geometry are these dotted lines in the sketches. Um, the dotted lines basically mean that when you go and you actually execute on the sketch to turn it into a feature, SolidWorks ignores anything that's dotted. It only focuses on the stuff that's solid lines. So at the sketch, what that means at the sketch level is you can go in there and you can, use, you can use these lines as sort of references in constructing the geometry and laying out the constraints. And then when you make the part, they kind of just disappear. Or you, when you go to make the extrude, it disappear. So you saw that over here. We use these, the, the construction lines to locate it. Um, we also can use it, you know, in this piece, you can see us using the construction lines to, to show the sort of, this, so I guess I should put some background. This, for those that don't recognize it, this is a tensioner for our 2019 drive base. It's basically holding a bearing in the middle, and it's got a slide on top of a tube. Well, it's going to fit over the tube, so let's put draw what the tube is in here, and then we can reference the things. You know, we, a lot of the things we care about are in relationship to how it interfaces with the tube. So now we can have, because we have these set sketch lines in here showing us where the tube is, we can now reference things to something that actually has importance. So you'll see here, let's say look at the location of the bearing relative to the, the tube. Well, that's constrained. You know, it's a stack up of the dimension, the distance between the bearing and the bottom of the tube and also between the hole, the mounting hole on the bottom and the bottom of the tube. So we could have just had one dimension that went all the way across, but this allows us to sort of split those two functions out and be able to update them separately. Uh, and, so, and you can also see it up top. You know, up top we have this plate that sits on top and we have these spacers that need to clear or these bolts that need to clear. Well, that's all dimensioned relative to the top of the tube rather than just some arbitrary point. Um, and construction geometry, you know, it's kind of, you can use it, you know, in, you know we, I guess in the, those gearboxes previously we had, a, you know, we had one separate part feature and then we referenced that in another feature, separate sketch that sort of laid out where the gears were and then we had another sketch that built the, the profile of the gearbox. Well, you can, you know, sometimes you kind of need the two to play together. You know, everything's intertwined of like the outside profile and the location of all the things are intertwined together. Um, so you can use center, sketch relationships to sort of basically paint the picture of where all the pieces are that you're interfacing and referencing to are. Um, and how and capture basically the, the, the relationships of how they kind of need to how they need to fit together to make the part work. Um, so this is our intake from our 2019 or 2018 robot, and you can see you know we've got the two wheels fitting in here. Um, we also had some question about how the box center would fit in here, so we actually it's unconstrained, but we have a, a box corner that we can drag through here. We have like the, the layout of all the you know the, the driving gears and all of the the um, other idler gears. We can kind of, it's a lot of stuff going on in here, um, but there's a reason it's all, kind of, it's all put together so that we can, can make sure that it all works together before we get to the end. Another sort of aspect of sort of des design intent is that, you know, Cameron asked earlier about origins and kind of why we put the origin one place or another. Well, where you put the origin makes a difference and makes, you know, has an impact on um, kind of how the part how you build the part out. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, but you, when you're sort of starting a piece, um, your first sketch that you put, you, you put in there, you're, you're actually, whether you know it or not, um, you're constraining, you're, you're building the part around an origin and a series of planes. Um, and so you want to think about sort of what, you want to think about, pick a logical spot for that origin that will aid you in sort of building the part out later. So you kind of want the origin around some center point of, um, of uh, like a, a focal point of the, the features. So like in this case, the origin is at the center of the part that we're clamping around. That's because a lot of things are going to be referenced to that point, so let's put the origin there. Um, the other thing that you want to pay attention to is, you know, as we, we showed earlier, that the, you know, like the, the part had a symmetric, you know, we had the piece that you know, we tied the left and the right, I guess it was with this guy even, tied the left and the right across the midline. Well, 
That's easy to do if the midline is at the point where the part is symmetric. Um, so here we have, um, here we have the, uh, you know, if you have symmetry in your part, you'd like to have your origin and your planes along that. Um, that helps you, helps you later. Um, so um, we talk, right now we, we'll up, we've been focusing a lot on sort of the, the sketches and sort of what sort of different things you can do in sketches to capture design intent. You can also, you also have a couple of options in how you use, how you do the extrudes on top of the sketches that I think have a lot of um, possibility, potential to sort of capture what your design intent is. Um, so when most people do a boss extrude, um, you're probably mostly focused on this number right here, which is how far is it going to extrude for? Well, there's a lot of other information that you can both, you know, a lot of other options that you can set and, you know, cap convey information through. And so um, there's, there's a, there's a drop-down menu that lets you choose um, where the sketch plane comes from, um, or sorry, where the feature starts. And then there's also a drop-down menu that defines how the feature ends. The default is blind. That's what gives you this number box down here. And then there's even an option to basically go two directions if you wanted to, if you wanted to do something fancier there. Um, so go through a little bit, you know, what, how do we use those to sort of capture design intent? So showed this block earlier, and you know, we wanted to have the origin in the middle of it because we have a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of holes that are referenced to the center of the part. Well, how do you get the origin in the middle? That comes from the direction, con you know, the direction constraint for the boss extrude. So instead of having it be blind, we can change it to mid-plane. Basically, that takes the width of the part and distributes it about the plane that it was built on. Um, so this is a way to sort of create some drive symmetry through your parts. Um, and, and then another one that you know, I think that a lot less often used is the, the from um, option. And you know, a, good, a, a good example here is that you know, we, we have this, this is a, a piece where we have these, a 3D printed part. And we have, want these pockets that we can put nuts into that will, that will, will help us mount it to something else. So we've got, you know, we drew the sketch for cutting out the nut pockets on the bottom of the part. But if we just extruded that, then we'd have nothing for the nut to capture against. Um, so rather than going through and like creating a secondary plane and then cutting off of that, um, well, we, we can do it all in one feature and sort of capture the design intent um, in one place. Um, and we can use the, the front, we can change the from condition. So we change the from condition from being on the plane, which is from sketch plane. Um, to, to, for, from offset. And so now we, can, now we have a dimension here where we can set how far up that nut pocket goes. Um, and then I didn't put examples here, but I think the, the other ones that I think are interesting is you can, you know, you can, with the, the from, you, don't ba you basically don't have to put the sketch plane, um, you don't have to put an extra sketch plane in. You can use, you know, you, the vertex is another great method for sort of defining where it's going to start or end, start from. And then same thing over here. If you have something where you know you want to cut or extrude up to a certain match a certain feature, well, don't just put in the same dimension as the other feature. You can actually tie them together. So when you update one, it updates the other. Um, and then another sort of point, finer, I like guess, more nuanced or smaller point is that when you're laying out the sketches, um, we have a lot of you know we talk about talked about wanting to have dimensions that capture what the design intent is. Well, one of the things you often want to do is basically dimension between two circles. Like, what's the gap between a circle and a line, or between two circles? Um, SolidWorks, when you use when you use SolidWorks and click on two circles to dimension on them, it defaults to dimensioning from the center of the circle to the center of the circle. Well, that's not really useful for a lot of the things we do. Um, so what you can do is you can change the arc condition. And so if you go to the, click on a dimension. You go to the leader tab, and then you scroll down to the bottom. There's this arc condition area. And you can choose whether it goes from the center, the minimum, or the maximum. And that lets you sort of you know, capture, like that's letting us here measure this gap. So we want the gap between the wheel and the tube. Is that's the thing we care about? Well, we can just dimension it directly. Or over here on the other side, you can also do an arc condition between a line. And so here we're doing the minimum between the line and the, the wheel here. Um, so so you can go in and you can edit, go into this tab and change it for any dimension that you've placed. Um, when, you're, when you're placing the dimensions, if you hold down shift, this will let you choose what point of the circle you want to reference to. So that's a, a handy way to, to shortcut through that. So this is, I guess this is for the, the later posterity. Um, but these are kind of all the topics that we just talked through that sort of aid us in capturing the design intent in our CAD. Um, then go a little bit through, you know, what are the sort of the, the things that you want to pay attention to to make the model easy to update? So I guess it's related to the previous topic, but a little bit different. Um, 
One of them, uh, this is, should be a pretty, you guys should probably, hopefully have all been exposed to this, but you want to basically make sure that the sketch is fully constrained. So in here, we have a sketch. We, in, okay, how do you know if it's fully constrained? Well, you know if it's fully constrained if you don't have any blue lines. So here we have some blue lines. Well, what's bad about blue lines? Um, it means that someone could come in, they could open up your part, and they could accidentally drag something, and then now it's over here, and you're like, well, you know, they didn't know, they might not even know they did it. Um, and then now the piece, you know, either the model doesn't match the part that was made, or someone had made a decision, and it goes from, like, not working to, uh, from working to not working. So really, you know, what you want to do is you want to constrain everything um, so that you end up with a black line. And so here is just a simple matter of putting a radius here. Um, so a lot, I think a lot of students, you know, when they start out, they're like, well, I don't actually know what radius I want here. Like, why don't I just not put something there? Isn't that, like, I don't want to make a decision. Well, you should just make a decision and put round numbers in and just guess. Because um, that, that's what we all do is, and people who've had a lot of experience with CAD, you basically just guess, and, huh, that looks about right. That's an even number. Put it in. Um, and if you're going about, if you're laying out the dimensions that capture sort of the core intent to, you know, the core design intent, it makes it really easy for someone to come back later and say, you know what, I think that's a little bit too thin. We want to make that web a little bit thicker so that it's going to have the strength that we need based on previous experience. Well, if you've laid out the part well, it's easy to come in and just change that dimension, and it automatically updates. So it's better that you make a decision early, um, come back and edit it later than not making a decision. Um, and then the other sort of thing here is that, um, I guess along with the design intent, as you're adding in these dimensions, you know, basically when you have a really complicated thing, it's like, well, how are you going to constrain it? Like, what do you do? So just think through, like, well, what's the most important thing? Okay, let's constrain that. Let's the next most important thing, you constrain that. And eventually you get down to, like, well, I'm just adding in random dimensions to make everything black. That's about what happens. But, you know, you'll, as, you know if you work your way from the most important to the least important, it will be set up well. Um, another thing is that fillets are stuff that, you know, you can put a fillet in as a feature or you can put a fillet in in a sketch. It's a lot easier to maintain if you put the fillets in as features afterwards. Um, the reason for that is that it's less things for you to do. Um, and also, um, it keeps the sketch from becoming cluttered. Um, and, and fillets are also something that will break as you sort of change the geometry. So if you have them in the sketch, when they break, you've got to like delete them, clean them up, do some other stuff, put new ones back. With a feature, it's a lot easier. You just go in, you edit the feature, you say, yep, delete all the bad ones, and let's put new ones in. Um, so here we go. This is the part that was, you know, the, the kind of the base feature on it. And then you can see that afterwards we went and we added in most of the fillets. There's like one fillet here and one fillet here that were, and I guess a fillet here. Those were put in at the sketch level because they were, they were important to the design. Um, the, guy, the feature here, we, need, we couldn't just put in any fillet. We needed to put a fillet in that didn't, you know, we left enough room for this hard stop to hit here. So we put the fillet in the part here. And same thing here. We wanted the, the, the fillet to start at the top of the tube for, I guess, aesthetics reasons. So put it in at the sketch level. Um, so, but by and large, if you can, put it in at the feature level. Another thing, um, as you're building out parts, um, split the unrelated items into multiple features. So you kind of, you know, there's a balance of like, you know, it's easier to, it's easier to cross-reference everything if you have everything in like one sketch. Um, but to go in and edit a part with it's just one sketch, it can take a lot can take a bit to, you know, when you're coming back to a part or coming back to coming to someone else's part and opening up, you're like, you open up and it's just one sketch. You look at it and you're like, uh, well, what's important here? What's, relate, you know, what's related to what? I need to basically move this hole somewhere. Is that going to change all these other things? I don't know. Or I need to get rid of these set of holes. Like, which ones do I delete and what's going to happen if I do that? Well, that's the kind of downsides from having everything together. You can mitigate that by, um, by having, like, you know, splitting out the features into multiple splitting out you know, the, the design features into multiple SOLIDWORKS features. So here we have a part, you know, this, this was a bracket for our, a pivot for our 2018 climber, like buddy climb. Um, so started out, we laid out the shape. That was kind of the, the main constraint based on sort of the size we had available and the strength that we wanted. Um, then we had some spring mounting holes, put in the spring mounting holes af you know, after that. Um, then put in the mounting holes for mounting all the, the mounting the part to it, you know, its, its mating part and also the, the bar that it was supporting. And then at the end, sort of added all the filleting and the lightning. Um, so kind of went through a series of stages. The advantages of doing that is, let's say we decide, oh, well, we don't want a spring. We want to move to the surgical tubing or something. Well, it's pretty easy to go in here. You just delete this feature, and you get rid of the spring holes. Um, keeps things separated out. Um, and then 
another way to look, you know, another thing you see on this, um, here we have that gearbox plate, same one from that um, 2019 intake. So we, when we were putting in the bearing holes and sort of even the, the mounting holes for the motor, we didn't put in the lightning holes at the same time. That's because the lightning holes for the 775 motors, they add like a lot of features and lines there. And we don't really care about, like they're not critical to the functionality of the part. We know it needs to have lightning, or we need to have vent holes for the motor. They can come in later. So that's what's happening here. And same thing here. We're adding this like clover leaf pattern on top of a motor bore. Um, and so instead of doing all of this stuff in one, in the sketch as we put in the motor bore, we put in a, just a circle to locate the part. And then we added this clover leaf cutout and patterned it around in separate features. And that kept the, the base part, the base sketch, to be a simpler one. Um, another thing, um, when, you're doing, when you're going through the part, uh, oftentimes, uh, students will want to, they'll, they'll like get to a stack point and say, well, I'll lighten it now. I know how to do lightning. Let me put all that in. Um, that's really not, doesn't lead to maintainable parts. Um, you want to put the lightning in at the end. Um, so the reason for that is that, you know, as you're designing the part, if you haven't answered all the questions and made sure that the piece is going to work without the lightning, you might have some, like, you know, observation, some learning that comes along that's going to cha fundamentally change the outside geometry of the part. Well, that's going to just screw up all the work that you did on the lightning. So you're going to waste a lot of time if you sort of get the lightning in too early. So what you want to do is, put, and then the other thing is that you know once you put the lightning in, stuff gets all complicated, um, and you also want it to reference all the location of the other things. So you want to do that sort of at the end of the assembly. Yes. Um, do we? Question was, do we prototype before we do the lightning? Um, we often don't um, because, well, our prototypes don't have lightning in them. Our prototypes are made of, often made of wood. Um, when we're getting to making the robot, we have a pretty good idea if it's going to work, and it's just better. To, we just, our philosophy is to just design it all for the first time and cut it once and assemble it once. But so in this piece here, you can see that we got all of the sort of key features in this gearbox laid out um, in the total profile set. And then there's a series of features to add the lightning holes in. And, you can notice all the fillets are separate from the sketches. Another way um, you know, makes things more maintainable is that if you're using, it's better to use linear patterns and um, mirrors and linear patterns as features than it is to do them as sketches. So this example here we saw earlier, it's basically got this cutout here and we want to have 14 of them around in a circle. So we could have done, in a sketch, we could have put this one cutout in and then done a circular pattern in the sketch to move it all around and get all of, all of them in one place. Well, that would have been one feature. So in one sense, it's simpler there. But the problem is that if you need to come in and you need to change this geometry, well, you got to, like, as soon as you start sort of adding or, or deleting lines in the sketch, well, the sketch circular patterns break down. Um, and they make it really hard to maintain. At the feature level, if you do the pattern at the feature level, well, it, it just all automatically updates. It's, it's much more forgiving. Um, so this both lets you have simpler sketches, and it also makes it more forgiving on the update. And similar thing with linear patterns. So right here, we have a series of, of holes, the mounting holes for something. Um, we wanted them at a one-inch pitch. Well, we could have done it in the sketch, but that but that would be, you know, it kind of clutters up the sketch and makes it harder to update. So here's using a linear pattern. Um, I actually, I'll plug this one because it's a favorite of mine. Um, there's a, most people do a linear pattern with just a, a distance linear pattern. Um, when doing holes, I think, I find that the curve driven linear pattern is actually a pretty nice way to lay things out. So what we're seeing here, this is the sketch. In, so this is a, a hole wizard feature. We've got a, you know, one point here and we know we want to have a series of holes along this line here. Um, so what we do is we put the first hole in and then we draw a line in the sketch at the, at the, um, hole wizard level that shows the sort of interface of how long we, we want the holes to be distributed over. Um, what this does is lets you capture the design intent of basically, you know, where is the pattern located and how long is the pattern going to go? Because that's like, that's the reason, you know, ultimately kind of the core thing you want to define. And then it splits up the decision of how many holes go on that line later. So uh, you can dig, I'll let you, you guys can dig through the, the pattern later, but basically you go in there and you, when you set up the pattern, you select the feature and then you select the line that you're going to, or the curve that you're going to pattern over and how many things you want on that curve. Um, so this is a nice, easy way to set something that's updatable, you know, matches on both sides and easy to update. We look at, you know, mirrors at the feature level are also, you know, for similar reasons, are easier to update. You only have to draw the thing once 
and then you can update it over to the other side. Um, this here is showing, um, this is our, I guess, 2018 frame rail. Um, you notice that a, a large amount of the part was modeled before we got to the point, you know, where we actually had it on both sides. Um, and this makes it, you know, what we do is, you know, when you're updating the part, you just go back before this mirrors, you add in whatever features you want, and then you can add it to the mirror, and it, it, uh, it easily updates. Or if you need to change something, you change it on one side, and it updates, and you, and you, you know for certain that you got it right, you know, the same on the other side, because uh, it's at the feature. Um, another sort of thing about maintainability is use, you know, so there are two ways that you can put holes in a part. You can use hole wizard or you can use an extrude cut. Um, so for an extrude cut, you know, you'd basically, in a, you know, this is not, this is hole wizard, but like an extrude cut, you'd be defining where the location of the hole is and what the size of the hole is in, in sort of that, that sketch in the feature. Um, the advantage with hole wizard is it basically splits up the decision between what size is the hole and what function the hole has from where the hole's located. So there's sort of three components here. Um, over here, you know, in the, in the sort of the first tab of the hole wizard, what you do is you pick what size, you know, basically you pick what the function of the hole is. So this is, um, so in this case, we wanted a hole that was a tapped hole for a 1032. Um, so we pick what we want the hole to do, and then SolidWorks knows, has a bunch of tables that it looks up, and it knows exactly what hole size you want to put in to be able to do that functionality. Um, and so that's like a huge advantage in itself. And then the other thing is it makes it easy to put, put it, the, the location down. So here, um, basically, it's kind of hard to see here, but every, there's a point at the corner of this rectangle. And everywhere there's a point entity, SolidWorks basically just puts a hole in there. So you can kind of, you can use, you know, sketch geometry um, to basically lay out where the holes go. And then SolidWorks will put them in per what you say. Um, we talked earlier about putting planes in a logical spot in the, in the part. I think it's you know, just as important um, to put planes in a logical spot in the assembly. Um, so that makes, you know, that's about, you, you know, I guess, this, so I guess in one case, you know, this assembly you know, has symmetry about it. Having the plane, you know, it makes sense to have the middle plane down the symmetry of the robot. You can actually use mirrored component feature patterns um, in SolidWorks so that it lets you do that. Um, it also is really useful for when you're building the assembly and sort of checking it. You know, often you know, I use tools, I use the, the section tool a lot to be able to see what's in there and you know, make sure that the inside of stuff is laying out fine. Um, and so if the planes are in a logical spot, it's easy to grab them for the section views. And so here, you know, see by using that mid plane in the middle, we can quickly go in and make sure that the center axle and the, the start of the gearbox is all located right. Another thing about maintainability um, is you want to make sure that, like, I think it's, it's good practice to go through and make sure that as you're updating the models that you're not having broken, you know, broken mates or features in, in the assembly. Um, this here is actually a, the model of our 2019 robot. Uh, stuff usually by the end of the season gets, loses maintenance or is not, doesn't get maintained well. So we have a couple of different broken features in here. But I guess by and large, we, we're, you know, our assemblies aren't terrible here. Um, the reason for doing, you know, taking care of things as you go and making sure that, it, you know, you don't have broken mates in there is that if something's broken, there, there's probably a reason why it was broken. Um, sometimes it's because a part was deleted and the mate didn't get deleted with it. But other times it's because, well, stuff doesn't line up or, you know, you moved the hole in one spot but not the other and now, you know, something is, you know, something doesn't, doesn't, isn't in the right spot. So it's, you know, going through and spending the time to, to debug that can, could lead to other learnings um, and also it, it um, it's easier to work with, with other people. So I think I need to scream through these last slides so we'll get going. Um, so then some, the next kind of part is, you know, I guess one of the sort of core challenges in CAD is like, you got a bunch of parts in a robot. You, all need, you need them to all line up. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. Um, but in the end of the day, you want a method that's easy to do and easy to update and maintain. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. I'm going to share my favorites. Um, everyone, I think this is something where people have opinions. It's really, you know, what's up, what works for you. So one of the ways, it's pretty simple, you know, just update both parts by hand. So there's no actual physical linking between these two pieces. All, but what we've done is we've put this sort of, so I guess I should back up. Here we have a part where we're locating, we're mounting, you know, a, a piece to a tube. Um, we have, we need to locate the holes. Well, let's just put the same sketch in both places. If you want to go update the whole location, it's pretty easy to go in and change something. You can even do this at a more complicated level. Here's sort of that linkage geometry sketch I was showing earlier. It has a couple key dimensions that get kind of referenced and pulled out in other sketches. So here we have the link of, length of this top link and then the offset of this pivot. 
and you'll see that those are just, you know, it's not, there's no direct link between them, but, you know, they're called out as the same core dimensions, and, and you know, you can just, if you change one, you just know to go in and change the other. The other thing we've done, started doing recently, is using multi-body parts to tie together references and assemblies. Um, it's basically, you can have multi-subparts within one, one multi-subparts in one part file. The advantage of this is that it keeps all of the references tied into one, you know, known location. Uh, so also you can, at the end, you know, when you're building it out, you can sort of see how everything is, is lined together. Um, it has some disadvantages that it's a little bit harder to do the, the CAM for the machining process and also make drawings out of it. But you can see here, you know, basically the, we didn't put everything in this one part, but we put the kind of core gearbox plates and how they work together. Um, the way you do that is that, um, that you can create multiple bodies in a part. There's basically like subparts in a given part. You just, there's an option here when you do an extrude and you can just unclick merge results and it basically creates another um, component that you can edit on. And then as you're doing things like cutting holes in things, well, let's say we have all these four gearbox plates. We only want the holes in one of the plates. Well, there's this feature scope menu. You can, you can say selected bodies and then you just select which bodies you want it to, to mate to. Same thing on all the extrude cuts. So we use these a lot. Um, and then kind of at the end, um, what, the way we work, get around drawings and cam is at the end we'll have like a series of uh, this, you know, we'll make a series of configurations that have just the individual pieces and we'll use these body delete heap features to, to, um, to, to isolate them out. Another thing you can do is you can use configurations. Um, so these are, so configurations are great if you have two parts that are very similar to each other in, fu in, you know, in function, but they just have a, cute, a few key features or dimensions different. So here's like one gearbox plate and here's another gearbox plate. The two configurations of the same in the same part file. This is great for you know it kind of once again it keeps all the relation all the references in one part file and it's sort of um, and you can update them in one location. Now the downside that we found with configurations as you start having a lot of variations between the two parts, um, it becomes hard to sort of keep track of all the references and make sure that the changes that you made to one configuration are not impacting negatively the another configuration because the, the defaults on how it all links together is, can sometimes be confusing. So this here is probably like on the edge of like, you know, a lot more is happening over here. There's a lot of differences here. It maybe would have been better as a multi-body part, maybe not. Certainly worked. Um, so this is kind of a summary of all the different solutions that I've sort of worked through for sort of referencing things together. Um, we went through these guys. Um, I think that some of the other things that I've done that, you know, not a fan of, or, you know, I guess the main one is in-context features. Some of you might be familiar with this. Basically, it's really fast to do, but it leads to problems down the road. Because um, you end up with the features, you end up with references that are tied between, between different parts um, and, and assemblies, and it's, if you want to use a part from that, like, nested reference um, matrix from one place, you know, take it from one context and put, use it in another, it's hard and it's, it you know, can be fragile and you can have broken references that you're really not sure what's happening. Um, another one is master parts with split bodies. That one's also kind of hard to maintain the references as you sort of work with it. Another one is equ equations with linked dimensions. Um, doesn't always auto-update like it should, and it can be real tedious to set in place. And then the, another one that was sort of layout sketch blocks. Um, have also had ba bad luck with that one sort of updating well. Um, and it's sort of cumbersome to use. So these are the ones that I use. Use a lot of this updating by hands ones where you just lay out this sketch in a logical manner and it's real easy to go in and change it to. So now some tips on kind of working quickly. Um, one of the main ones as you kind of learn and to use SolidWorks more, you should go in and you should set up different shortcut keys for the common functions that you use. Um, this lets you work a lot faster and really it's about sort of like there's sort of when you're, you're catting, you're actually doing, you're doing designing you're making design decisions and then you're executing on them. So this lets you minimize the amount of time that you're spending executing so you can focus on making the right design decisions. Um, just makes things faster in general. Another thing that's about speed of updating things. So we have this part here where we wanted, to, let's say we wanted to update the length of the link. Well, we could open up the part, we could edit the sketch, we could change the dimension. Or if you're in the assembly, you just double click on the face that's related to that feature, double click on the dimension, and you can edit it right there. Another one, you, know, you probably saw this through places, you can both label features and dimensions to help yourself out later when you're trying to update things. So this transmission plate that's kind of evolved over a couple of years, everything's labeled so we know what's where. And then in here in this, this assembly, you know, there's some key dimensions and we put labels on them to capture, well, what is that key thing we're capturing? So if you want to update it, it's clear what to change. Another one is you're in assemblies, 
use cross sections a lot to make on shafts to make sure that there's not intersections or you know that the, you know, the design intents captured right. And here, even looking through here, we had an extra spacer on there that was intersecting. So it's great for catching things like this. Um, another one, uh, use put together part libraries. We have a part library that I think we post online that you can borrow or put together your own one that kind of shares a bunch of the common components like the bearings and the screws. Um, and so it makes it so that everyone's not downloading their own copy of a screw. And it also makes it when you put a screw in, you just drop it in. We have them set up with configuration so we can drop it in and then set the length and size of it. So it makes it easy to update things. Same with our bearings. Um, also, when you're building things out, you know, pick different logical sub-assemblies so that you can kind of both, you know, segregate the problem down into smaller spaces and it makes it sort of easier to keep track of and it also makes it easier to collaborate with people. Hi, I'm Sarah and a mentor on FRC Team 971. We hope you enjoyed this video. For more videos and resources, please subscribe and visit our website, frc971.org.